All right, hello, hello, and welcome to a video about strategies for success in multiple choice questions. We're going to be focusing specifically on Unit 4, Area Study 1, so budgetary policy and monetary policy. This comes from a request from an email I got last night about just kind of breaking down the strategy of how you go about answering multiple choice questions. So we'll do it with the stuff that's currently relevant to you and will potentially be relevant to you coming up to the exam. Um, we're going to look at all the budgetary and monetary policy questions from the study design. So it essentially ends up being 10 uh, multiple choice questions from the last four years or thereabouts. Um, but first up, we're going to go with some basically hints and strategies I like to tell my students about when going with multiple choice questions. Then we'll go through the questions one by one and we'll go through it from there. So first up, really recommend highlighting keywords in the question. So there are some really, really um, words that like to come up a lot. So VCAR loves things like which of the following is not, which of the following is least likely, which of the following has a different impact to the others? There are all these kind of things where it gets complicated or um, something like which of the following is not least likely to. And it's just like it ends up being a double negative. VCAR loves to make things overly complicated because they are sometimes testing your ability to read rather than your ability to understand economics. So highlighting those key directional words like not, least likely, etc., will mean that you're less likely to slip up and make those silly little mistakes. Um, two of the answers are normally completely wrong. So just drawing a line through them straight away means they won't distract you anymore. And you can just focus on the two answers that are most likely to be correct. Sometimes it's not about selecting um, a correct answer, it's about selecting the most correct answer. So just because a statement's correct doesn't mean it's the best answer. Sometimes a statement might be correct and it might be number a, it might be A. So you'll just circle it and move on. But there might have been one underneath that that ends up being far better. Um, an example that I've used before in classes is kind of like um, which of the following uh, is a definition or the best definition of strong sustainable economic growth and A might be a annual real annual GDP growth by 3 to 3.5% per year but that doesn't really fully do it like the one at the bottom will be like the actual definition for strong sustainable economic growth and a lot of people will just pick the 3 to 3.5% real GDP growth which is not the most correct answer because it ignores kind of ignores the sustainability part if it comes up later when answering questions about impacts or effects Draw an up or down arrow next to each question to quickly show its impact. So things like, um, if it's like an increase in disposable income, you can just be like, well, that's going to be good for aggregate demand. So a little arrow there. And then if I have three up arrows and a down arrow for one question, I'm like, well, the down one's going to be wrong. So I'm going to pick that one because that's the only one that's different. Therefore, that's going to be the answer. Um, and use reading time to answer the multiple choice questions. So a lot of people read all the multiple choice questions and just kind of leave it at that. Um, but you can't really do a lot with the short answer in reading time. Although you can go through them, kind of plan some answers in your head, you are going to forget those when there is a lot of short answer, especially on the end of your exam. Whereas multiple choice, there's, depending on your stack, five, 10, 15 of them. You can go through them, get to the correct answer, rule out answers, and then when you get to writing time, just quickly answer them all and save yourself a lot of time. So we do the most logical thinking because the responses are actually on the page. So you don't have to memorize them and have to remember how to rewrite them later on. They're already there. You only have to recall which one you thought was correct. So using reading time to answer those is actually a really, really useful um, use of your time. So let's get into some questions and talk through the logic of them. So which of the following is least likely to be a monetary policy transmission mechanism resulting from lower interest rates? So straight away, we're going to go into our highlighting things. So least likely that is going to be one that comes up there. And so we're going to be talking about um, an example of one that's least likely to result from lower interest rates. So lower being the next uh, directional word that we've got there. So if interest rates are decreasing, what's going to be the least likely impact from that? So from this, we look at the responses. We've got an increase in net capital inflow, an increase in borrowings for housing investment, a decrease in imports resulting from a fall in the value of the Australian dollar, and an increase in exports resulting from a fall in the value of the Australian dollar. So let's start off with looking at the value of the Australian dollar. What do we know about lower interest rates and the value of the Australian dollar? Well, we know that when interest rates go down, so lower interest rates usually lead to um, businesses withdrawing their investments from Australian banks in search of greater return elsewhere. So that ends up flooding the Australian, um, the foreign exchange market with Australian dollars, which leads to a depreciation of the Australian dollar. So the fall in the value of the Australian dollar, these two ones, a decrease in imports, well, that would happen from a fall in the Australian dollar, so that's correct. And an increase in exports from a fall in the Australian dollar, that would also happen, so that is correct. So we've got two of those answers that we can already rule out because they're not least likely to happen. They will happen. Uh, an increase in borrowings for housing investment. So if there's lower interest rates, are people going to borrow more money to buy houses? Yes, they are. Whereas an increase in net capital inflow, people are not going to invest in Australia if there are lower interest rates because 
they're not going to get a high return on that investment. They can get a high return elsewhere. So therefore, we can rule out three of those answers very quickly as I draw terrible lines through them and then go with A as the correct answer. So there we go. One down, a bunch to go. Um, one weakness of budgetary policy compared with monetary policy is that budgetary policy, so we want to compare um, weaknesses here. Hopefully you know strengths and weaknesses of budgetary and monetary policy. So um, budgetary policy may be subject to political constraints. Well, technically true, they've got to vote on things, etc. Can target certain parts of the economy to give assistance. Well, that's not a weakness, so we can rule out that one. Not a weakness at all, that's a strength. Um, maybe counteracted by the operation of automatic stabilizers. Um, also kind of a strength, that's going to be a good thing, we want that to happen. It tends to be relatively ineffective in a recession due to low levels of consumer confidence. Well that's about monetary policy, not budgetary policy. So we can rule out those bottom three again, and the answer is A, maybe subject to political constraints. That one's pretty straight up theoretical, you probably would have read A and was like, that's a correct answer, and briefly read the others. Let's go with this one, question seven from the 2019 VCAR exam. As the world economy slows, the government's budget outcome may. So we've got A, deteriorate as demand for Australian exports decreases, improve as employment in Australia increases, C, deteriorate as domestic output increases, and B, improve as company profits increase. Say so the world economy is slowing, what's happening? Well, if the world economy is slowing, the Australian economy is likely slowing too because we rely on a lot of the world economy. Let's rule out some answers straight away. So um, B, improve as employment in Australia increases. Well, that's not going to happen. Deteriorate as domestic output increases, output's not going to increase. Improve as company profits increase, no, that's also not going to happen. Deteriorate as demand for Australian exports decreases, correct, that is likely to happen. They were not going to buy our exports, therefore deteriorate. A three times in a row is kind of weird. Strange that that's happened in the order of the questions that have come through. Hopefully we're going to get a different option coming up soon. Uh, all right, this is where things get a little bit more confusing as I've gone through these with my classes this morning. And two students who normally do not agree agreed that I was incorrect when I was correct. So let's go through these, talk about how um, the RBA buying and selling government securities impacts the short term money market or the overnight money market. So, question 12 from the 2019 VCAR exam A contractionary stance in monetary policy of the RBA could be achieved by what? So, contractionary stance, we know that that means they want to. They want to, I'm just trying not to touch a button on my pen at the same time. They want to increase interest rates or increase the cash rate really, but we'll go with that. So when they want to do that, they want to decrease the cash and the money supply or the overnight money market. So they want to decrease the liquidity and then that is going to lead to higher cash rate and therefore higher interest rates. So how do they do that? Do they do that by buying or selling? So what's really, really important here is that when the RBA buys government securities, it means they are buying them off of financial institutions and that money is going into the short-term money market and that is going to decrease, it's going to increase the amount of money in the short-term money market and then that will decrease um, interest rates overall, or the cash rate overall. When they sell government securities, they sell them to financial institutions. Financial institutions have to use the money from the short-term money market to buy them off the RBA, and that decreases the overall cash in the short-term money market. So we know in this case, they need to sell government securities to decrease the cash in the overnight money market. So we're gonna go C, it's really difficult though. So I always remain like, I do this now all the time, just like, um, sell equals higher cash rate buy equals lower cash rate i have to have that somewhere because i find it still even though i'm an adult who's done this for many many years and i'm technically an expert at it i still get confused by it occasionally because it's a step by step is difficult so selling government securities to decrease cash in the overnight money market ends up being the correct answer which one of the following would reduce the size of the government's budget deficit? So we've got company tax cuts, personal income tax cuts, an increase in the rate of the goods and services tax, and increasing of the tax-free threshold. So what's happening here is basically saying, is are these going to increase revenues or decrease revenues? So company tax cuts, that's going to decrease revenues. Personal income tax cuts, that's going to decrease revenues. 
increasing the rate of the government goods and services tax is going to increase revenues, increasing the tax free threshold that is going to decrease revenues. Therefore, C is the correct answer. Pretty quick one, nice and easy. Always like that. Then we've got question 12 from the 2018 VCAR exam. When the RBA, when the economy is experiencing low rates of inflation, low rates of economic growth and employment growth, the RBA is likely to. So we're gonna assume that all of these mean that they are below their goals. So then we need to know if they're below the goals, they want to stimulate the economy. So they want to lower the cash rate. So we're gonna think we're like, okay, selling, equals higher cash rate, buying equals lower cash rate. So now we're like, all right, if they buy government securities, is gonna put the money into the short-term money market, increasing the liquidity, decreasing the cash rate. So we can rule out two answers straight away. So they want to purchase government securities in order to decrease the cash rate, that ends up being D. Perfect. So if they purchase government securities, increase the amount of cash in the short term money market, decreases the cash rate overall. Perfect. Imagine the government's budget is in surplus. If the rate of economic growth were to slow, this may ultimately result in a what? So they're in surplus. Will it end up being a smaller budget to surplus as receipts rise and outlays fall? No, that wouldn't work. That doesn't make logical sense. So no. Because if economic growth were to slow, receipts would fall and outlays would probably rise. A budget deficit as receipts rise and outlays fall. Once again, receipts wouldn't rise and outlays wouldn't fall. Um, once again, outlays, okay, we can rule that one out too. And then that ends up being a smaller surplus budget as receipts fall and outlays rise. That is the only one that makes logical sense. Therefore, it is the correct answer. Question two from the 2017 VCAR exam, which of the following might help reduce a government's budget deficit? So a slowing of growth in the world economy, not great, that's gonna mean less exports, less business tax, less revenues for the government. B, reducing the marginal rate of personal income tax, less revenues from the government, that's not gonna reduce the deficit. Removing the means test on some items of government welfare, that means more people are gonna have access to welfare, which would not reduce the um, budget deficit. Moving the exemptions of education and food from the goods and services tax. That means there will be GST on education and food and therefore that will be more revenues coming in. The government has more revenues, that's gonna mean there's gonna be a lower budget deficit. So that will help them reduce that budget deficit. Therefore, that is the correct answer. And then our second last one, question 13 from the 2017 VCAR exam. As the level of, economic, as the level of aggregate demand slows, the budget outcome will. So aggregate demand slowing down, what's gonna to happen to the budget uh, outcome? Well, we know when aggregate demand slows, unemployment goes up. So that means tax re revenues go down, welfare outlays go up. So therefore it's not going to improve as unemployment increases, there's gonna be less tax revenue. So we can take out this improve as well. So then deteriorate as unemployment increases or deteriorate as social security payments decrease. Well, they're gonna be paying more of those. So deteriorate as unemployment increases, perfect. One more, let's see how we go. One more of the RBA buying and selling government securities because VCAR loves to do this because people screw it up, like I do occasionally, but not today because I've planned for this. Question 14 from the 2017 VCAR exam. So when the RBA buys government securities on the overnight money market, the effect will be what? So they buy them, this puts money into the short-term money market, so this is increasing the supply of cash. So we can rule out two. If we increase the supply of cash, what are we doing? We are trying to decrease the cash rate because it's more liquid, there's more available, and therefore puts downward pressure on the cash rate. So therefore, increasing the supply of cash in the short-term money market and decreasing the cash rate. There we go. There are 10 different multiple choice questions from past exams and kind of my strategies for defeating them. We did that in 14 minutes. So therefore, you can probably do it a minute each in the in a SACA exam, because you should hopefully be able to think in your head quickly and I'm talking out loud and scribbling notes. So then final stuff, thank you for watching. If you'd like this and you want more help, exam tips, going through every little bit of content, go to my website, www.therunningeconomy.com, sign up to my unit three and four revision lecture. It's in September in the school holidays. It's the last Friday of school holidays. It's $20, it's online. It will go from 10 a.m. realistically till we finish, it says to one PM, but we'll probably keep going depending on the amount of people, the amount of questions that people have. We have to get through a lot of content as well as talk about um, exam tips and tricks, 
all those kind of things. And I want to tailor it to what people want. So when people sign up, there is a questionnaire to say like what areas you want to focus on. And there's already been a lot in unit three, area study three. So we'll spend more time there based on that. On that, I hope you have a wonderful day on your hopefully last day of lockdown as you return to school tomorrow. And I will talk to you next time. If you have any requests for videos or anything like that, hit me up, sean at the running economy.com. See you later.